Welcome everybody. It's a very great pleasure for me to introduce Professor David Edgerton, who is one of the most influential historians of technology and historians of modern Britain. He is now a Hans Rosing Professor of the History of Science and Technology and Professor of Modern British History at the Department of History of King's College, London. He has uh, received various recognitions, among which I would like to mention the 2009 Wilkinson Bernal Medewa Prize Lecture at the Royal Society and the Fellowship of the British Academy. He has written various very important books, which, which I think I sh they shaped uh, many scholars in British history and the history of technology and science technology. Uh, I would like to mention only the most recent one, The Rise and Fall of the British Nation, a 20th Century History, an account which has helped change how contemporary British history is thought about. For today's meeting, however, it's important to underline that Professor Edgerton has developed a new approach to the histories of technology, focusing on the asking new historical questions and avoiding the innovation and academic-centric accounts derived from the discourses of most interested parties. This approach has shaped its fundamental, innovative, and thought-provoking book, The Shock of the Old, Technology and Global History Since 1900, that has been translated in various languages, including French, Spanish, Korean, and Chinese. Today's lecture will invite us to reflect on the schools, the challenging views which are developed in this book. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Roberto. It's a, it's, a, it's a great pleasure and honor to be uh, uh, here in the beautiful city of Turin and this august uh, uh, institution uh, as well. I'm very sorry that I won't be able to address you in Italian. I will continue in English, um, uh, especially as I have to tell you uh, that I have a grandfather who was born uh, in Italy and emigrated to Argentina, as some people call it the land of forgetting, and one of the things that was forgotten was perhaps not the Italian language, but, uh, but a, uh, a dialect of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, of Italian. So, we are constantly urged to think about the impact of the new on our lives, and particularly of new technologies. They are thought of as being profoundly original, new technologies that are, are going to change the world in such a way that our knowledge will become redundant. Our knowledge of the past and the present will become redundant. Those are the stories that we're told. But as a historian of these matters, what I find most surprising is that nearly everything that's said about new technologies has been said before. It's completely unoriginal. Mm -hmm. So we have a paradox and the argument that everything is going to change except the way we think about that change or we describe that change. There's nothing revolutionary in the talk about revolutionary technology. It is deeply familiar. Mm -hmm. So, the supposedly radically new is actually going to do things which other novelties supposedly have already done in the past. Mm -hmm. So new technology will create unemployment, it will start a new industrial revolution, it will bring world peace, it will destroy the world, it will save the world. Utterly unoriginal arguments again. In the face of this deluge of tedious lack of originality, I want to suggest that we need fresh ways of thinking about the material, how it changes, and how it changes society. We need a new way of thinking if we are to create and to adopt, uh, in a rational way, the new techniques that we will need, for example, to deal with climate change, and for, indeed for many other reasons as well. We need, in short, a revolution in how we think about the technical and its relation to society, not just uh, in the future, but in the past and in the present. But that revolution will be very difficult to bring about because our current way of thinking is so entrenched. 
We all know about technology, what the important ones are, what the effects will be. So we're told we need to spread the word about the relations of technology and society. But we shouldn't spread the word. We should stop using the language we use to describe technology. We need to silence the nonsense that surrounds this topic. We need censorship, basically. Yeah? We, we, we need an index of technological nonsense, hmm? and one that's strictly uh, enforced. But we also uh, need to recognize our ignorance and adopt a position of modesty in the face of this ignorance and the claims we might make about the relations of technology and society. Let me illustrate how we think collectively about technology and uh, society. I'm going to use the example of Klaus Schwab, the director of uh, the World Economic Forum at Davos, a very important man uh, whose uh, uh, thoughts on technology, as my thesis requires, are not original in any way. Hmm? So I'm not attacking him. I'm taking him as an authoritative example of the way that technology and society is talked about. Now, he's had an extraordinary success in this field. In 2016, he started speaking and writing about something called the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And we've all heard of it. Hmm? Uh, government ministers have heard of it. They put it into their speeches. Uh, uh, government science policy experts have heard of it, and they put it into their programs for research. It's, we have conferences on the fourth industrial revolution. It's an extraordinary impact this man has had. Uh, but this concept of the fourth industrial revolution, which I think is beyond satire, has become the talk of the age. It's an exemplary case of the diffusion of uh, particularly unhelpful ways of thinking about technology. As I say, it's not uniquely uh, Schwab's or, uh, 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 of a character or uniquely characteristic of Davos man, as he might be uh, called. We find exactly the same argument uh, in academic work. Even in my own field, I will find people talking about fourth industrial uh, revolutions. Now, what did Herr Schwab have to say? Well, like most people writing about the Fourth Industrial Revolution, he had to start with history. And it's extraordinary how powerful history is in, in this futurological thinking. Mm. It's a very special kind of history, as we shall, we shall see. I'm going to quote. The First Industrial Revolution used water and steam to mechanize production. The second used electric power to create mass production. The third used electronics and information technology to automate production. Now a fourth industrial revolution is building on the third, the digital revolution that has been occurring since the middle of the last century. It is characterized by a fusion of technologies that is blurring the lines between the physical, the digital, and biological spheres. All very familiar, isn't it? We've heard it a thousand times before. He goes on. The speed of current breakthroughs has no historical precedent. None. When compared with previous industrial revolutions, the fourth is evolving at an exponential rather than a linear pace. Moreover, it is disrupting almost every industry in every country. Hmm? And the breadth and depth of these changes herald the transformation of entire systems of production, management, and governance. Nothing will stay the same. Hmm? Finally, almost finally, uh, he has an account of the present and how it differs from the past. Already, he says, artificial intelligence, this is the key to the fourth industrial revolution, is all around us, all around us. 
from self-driving self cars, I, like you, I'm sure, arrived in one, did we not? Uh, and drones to virtual assistants and software that translate or invest. Impressive progress has been made in AI in recent years, driven by exponential, that word again, increases in computing power and by the availability of vast amounts of uh, uh, data. Digital fabrication technologies, meanwhile, are interacting with the biological world on a daily basis. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, I certainly didn't. Uh, engineers, designers, and architects are combining computational design, additive manufacturing, materials engineering, and synthetic biology to pioneer a symbiosis between microorganisms, our bodies, the products we consume, and even the buildings we inhabit. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, and he ends with this. Uh, that uh, Today, ordering a cab, or booking a flight, or buying a product, making a payment, listening to music, watching a film, or playing a game, any of these can now be done remotely. Mm -hmm. Now we have a history of the past, of the present, and an implied history of the future. All very, very familiar. He didn't mention a single technology we haven't heard of. He didn't mention a single effect we wouldn't have guessed. Hmm? Yeah? And that's the, that's the, 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 the trick. We believe him to be essentially correct, if perhaps a little exaggerated. I want to suggest that he's not correct about really anything. Hmm? He is just wrong. Now, let's start. Let's just go through these arguments of his that are so familiar, so powerful. Was the first Industrial Revolution just about water and steam? Hmm? Uh, was this the one thing that changed everything? Weren't there any other technical developments? Weren't there other changes which perhaps had something to do with what we call the um, first Industrial Revolution? Why has he chosen water and steam? Is there any rationale for this? What about the second Industrial Revolution? Was it really just electricity and mass production? What about chemistry? The entirety of chemistry. What about steel uh, production? What about any number of other things? The cinema, let us say. And the third, digital since the 1950s. Is this the only change that has happened since the 1950s? Hmm? Was not mass production something to do with automation down in Mirafiori or Lingotto? Hmm? Is it the case that it's only now that we've linked the biological with the mechanical, with the, with the digital? Can this be right? Hmm. Why speak about revolutions at all? Uh, what is the evidence that things change so fundamentally that this should be called a revolution? Uh, why are some things revolutionary and not others? Why assume that there was a radical discontinuity in the history of technology four times hmm, that allows us to speak of revolutions as opposed to continuous change? And why four industrial revolutions? Mm -hmm. Why not 24? And why not two? Hmm? Yeah, there's no need for any evidence. Mm -hmm. And this is where it gets really interesting, because if you go back to history, you will find people talking about a fourth industrial revolution in the 1940s. And they will say there, it wasn't artificial intelligence, it was rockets and atomic power that were driving this fourth industrial revolution. And if you want, you can easily find people talking about second industrial revolutions in 1915, in 1920, in 1930, 1931, in 1950, in 1960. You can find people talking about a third industrial revolution in the 1930s. Hmm? Yeah. So why has he chosen four? Hmm? And why has he chosen a different four to the ones implied by past analysts who surely 
had some idea of what was going uh, um, on. They cannot all be right, can they? Hmm? Yeah, it's, it, there's a, there is a self-evident contradiction going on uh, 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 here. Uh, and to take the fourth industrial revolution, why is it the fourth and not the fifth? What well, indeed the, the 24th? And why is it being done by artificial intelligence and not something else? So they are, uh, actually Schwab is, is in some ways undercutting uh, his argument for novelty by insisting it's a fourth industrial revolution that's, that's happening. Because there are some people, especially people who advocate for AI, who say that AI is going to bring about a second industrial revolution. Yeah? And that's a good thing to do if you're an advocate for AI. Hmm? Because what you're saying is, this one is really big. It's as big as the first one, which is the one that's been transforming our lives up to now. If you say, this is the fourth or fifth or sixth, say, ah, you know. What, another one? No, no, that's not so, not so interesting. So he hasn't quite got hit the propagandistic uh, uh, story uh, quite uh, right. But as I say, others have. And they definitely insist on a second machine age or a second industrial uh, revolution. But those people also have the problem of saying, well, it's a second industrial revolution that we're, that we're going through. And somebody could potentially come up and say, but hang on, uh, Herr Schwab told us it's the fourth. And other people have said there was a third in the 1930s. So what happened to all those other industrial revolutions that we were promised? Are you telling us none of them happened and we had to wait for AI? So again, the argument uh, uh, collapses. So, problems. But here's another problem. A false account of uh, the past and what we could and could not do. Is it the case, for example, that no machines were involved in production before the Industrial Revolution, before, say, 1800? Surely there were. No? Surely there were things like windmills, for example, to mill our grain, to take a totally obvious example. Hmm? But in these narratives, we can, we can make these extraordinary historical claims, yeah? our inability to do things before machines came along. Think of the things that Schwab told us we could only now do remotely. Hmm? ordering a cab, a flight, uh, whatever, whatever that list was. Actually, we've been doing things remotely for more than 100 years. Hmm? In the United States, you had this extraordinary system of mail order catalogs in the late 19th century. Hmm? You wanted a new bit of equipment, you wrote a letter to Chicago. Hmm? to a great warehouse, and they sent out what you needed, remote ordering on a vast scale, yeah, more than 100 years ago. And I don't know about you, uh, uh, I have ordered flights using a telephone with a dial yeah, in, my, in, my, in, 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 my, in my time, uh, ordered theater tickets in that, in that way, done all sorts of things. Uh, remotely, even actually communicated with the other side of the world before the invention of the internet, much less artificial uh, intelligence. Another example, is it remotely true uh, that physical information and the biological are only now being connected? Have we not had the food industry for thousands and thousands of years? Yeah. Have we not manipulated microorganisms to produce bread and wine for millennia? Mm. Well, no, we can only now do it with uh, these new technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah. It's, ex it's extraordinary. What about the argument that previous growth was linear and now exponential. Now all the engineers in the audience say, obviously this man doesn't understand what exponential and linear means, and you'd of course be completely right. 
But let's assume <laughs> that he had some inkling of what these things uh, 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 meant. Well, um, uh, you, you could argue, in the case of Europe, that growth was once exponential and is now linear. Uh, and if it is still exponential, the exponent is smaller than it once was. Yeah? It's the exact opposite of what he wants to uh, imply. If we think about places that really are growing very fast, really, really are, we need to think of China, exponential rate of, let's say, 10% per annum for some, for some decades. China now accounts for, I don't know, maybe one third of the world economy, half the steel, half the coal. But how are we to characterize this? Is China being driven with this exponential growth of 10% by the fourth industrial revolution? It doesn't make sense, does it? Hmm? China is being driven by coal, it's been driven by steam, it's been driven by water, it's been driven by mass production, it's been driven by electrification. Yeah. So again, the whole argument becomes nonsensical. Hmm? So how are we to, uh, uh, um, well, what can we say about, about this? Well, uh, this story of the fourth industrial revolution and the preceding revolutions makes no sense as history of technology. It makes no sense as history of revolutions or, or of society. It makes no sense as a history of the impact of technology on society. It doesn't describe anywhere in the world no real place in the world, much less does it describe the whole of the world. It is at multiple levels, not only a conceptual mess, but an empirical mess. Hmm? No. It is not, however, any old empirical mess. It's not random nonsense. Hmm? As I've said, this is a very familiar uh, story, hmm? and that's what we need to understand. It is a claim about very particular technologies being important, ones which we are very familiar with. Mm -hmm. It is a claim about discontinuities in technical development that give us revolutions. It's a history of imagined places that we think we know where these revolutions uh, uh, happen, and not a history of the, of the whole world, though it pretends to be a universal history, the history of us all. It's also an, an account which is simply asserted. It is not put in dialogue with any other accounts, not least of other industrial uh, revolutions, and there is no need to produce any empirical evidence to justify the story that has been uh, told. There is no need for argument or evidence. And indeed, if you were to ask for argument or evidence, the whole story would collapse in the way I have uh, suggested. The most important thing, I think, about this is that it is a familiar story. And that's the key to it. We know it already. Mm -hmm. And it suggests a rule for success. If you want to be the next Klaus Schwab and you want to have us all talking about a fifth industrial revolution, let's say, this is what you should do. You need to have your account be sufficiently cliched yeah, to be thought authoritative, yet sufficiently different so people think you are being original. Mm? Yeah. Uh, but you also must be in complete denial about the existence of any previous account of these industrial revolutions, while at the same time being faithful to exactly those accounts. Yeah. So it's weird, it's weird, this, uh, this story. These are fairy stories for grown-ups, aren't they? Something like that. Yes, Little Red Riding Hood. Uh, it's, that kind of, it's that kind of story. Now, why is it possible uh, in the age of the fourth industrial revolution 
to, to still talk this way about technology and society? What is the magic force that keeps these stories uh, going? And I think in part, actually, it comes from the, the word technology, which does something very strange to our brains. Because we wouldn't think about the history of food and the future of food in this way. We wouldn't think about washing machines and their history and how they might change in this way. We wouldn't think about motor cars in this way. But once we think about technology, something goes funny in our brains. There's a disconnection uh, 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 in, in, in our brains. And that's very problematic because technology, like science, is a master concept in modernity. But it has these extraordinary slippery meanings. At one moment, technology is the latest technical development, and the next, it's the very infrastructure of human uh, existence. Mm -hmm. And very often, technology is associated not with the past or the present, but with the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we end up speaking about technology uh, uh, without having to know anything about its present or its, or its past. We can just invent things about its uh, future. So the very term technology, I think, somehow turns us into ignoramuses about the material. Very strange. Now, I suggest that we need to do better than this. Can we get a better account of technology and society? Well, perhaps artificial intelligence could help us here. After all, it would allow us to uh, translate from lots of languages very successfully. It can agglomerate our knowledge and bring out the main arguments that are made. Surely this would be a brilliant use for this new invention, to give us a proper account of technology and society. But if we were to ask ChatGPT and it went around all the written texts on technology and society, what would it tell us? Well, it would tell us exactly pretty much what Klaus Schwab told us. In other words, it wouldn't help at all. It would just reproduce the same problems that we have. Maybe we could have a more sophisticated version, which would look at economic statistics and industrial statistics and things like that. Could that produce a decent picture of the relations of technology and society? Actually, I think not. Mm -hmm. But imagine a really clever AI program with a vast new uh, 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 data source that tracked every molecule in the world, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And then artificial intelligence could give us an account of the material constitution of our world and how it's changing, and perhaps even how it's affecting society. But the point is, we are nowhere near having either that statistical capability, of course, obviously, uh, nor do we have the interpretive capability of doing that. But we have an alternative. Instead of use, waiting for the data or waiting for AI, we can use our human intelligence and our existing knowledge uh, to produce a picture radically better than that produced by the tech gurus and uh, uh, Davos. Now, what would we need in order to do this? Well, first of all, a history of all inventions and all innovations. You might think we have that, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't. Mm -hmm. We have a history of a tiny number of inventions that we take to be important and successful. Mm -hmm. But having a, a proper history of invention would be marvelous. And it would be a very interesting history, because it would be largely a history of failure not a history of success. 90% of patents are not exploited, to give one very poor um, measure. Uh, we could check if there are radical discontinuities in invention over time. It would become an empirical question, interesting empirical uh, 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 question. And indeed, we'd also realize that um, we have to we have to reject most technologies, and that humanity has, in fact, over time, rejected, certainly in the recent 
past, rejected most of the new technologies that have been on offer. If we hadn't done that, we'd be inundated with lots of different things to sit on, lots of different forms of transportation. The world would be a complete mess which we couldn't uh, uh, navigate. Secondly, we need a history of the things in use. What was actually being used where and when? And amazingly, we don't have one. Our histories of technology are focused on the early history of things we think became important in the future, not on what was most used or indeed what was indeed the most important. Hmm. So our histories of technology would place the motor car in the so-called second industrial revolution, the beginning of the 20th century. But of course, we are today, perhaps not in Turin itself in terms of production, living in the great age of the motor car. There are more cars being produced today than ever before in world history. It's completely uh, uh, obvious. Now, there's a profound and important point here, which is that the, the new does not necessarily replace the old. The new uh, arrives on top of the old, adds to the old. Uh, and it's in symbiosis with the old. And I want to take an example from a brilliant new book by my former colleague, uh, Jean-Baptiste uh, Frezos. He points out that we're constantly told that we need to transition from fossil fuels to renewable forms of energy, and that such transitions have happened in the past. We just have to do the same thing again. We have to shift from wood to coal again, or from coal to, to oil, or from oil to something uh, else. But Frezos points out that the consumption of wood, the consumption of coal, and the consumption of oil all continue to increase. There has been no transition from wood or from coal or from oil. None. It has not happened ever, yeah? except in particular, in particular regimes like electricity generation. Of course, it happens. But at, uh, at the level of the world as a whole, it has not happen. Shares changed, but absolute amounts continue to uh, uh, increase. Uh, we have to hope that we are approaching peak oil and peak coal, but we are not there yet, probably. More than this, he points out that coal production required wood, timber. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed, that oil production required wooden barrels. And then it required steel pipes. Steel pipes required coal. Coal required wood. Yeah. So there's no escape, at least no easy escape, from these symbiotic uh, relationships. Wind turbines require steel, which require coal, which require perhaps wood, not so much for that purpose uh, uh, today. And then there are techniques that seem to be obsolete and then acquire a new lease of life. Uh, there are more passenger ships, or pass yeah, places for passengers on ships today than ever before in world history. And as Italians, you will know that, because Italy is one of the great producers of cruise ships. But imagine if you, Italy had had a, a, future, a very futuristic minister of industry in the 1970s, and somebody came to him and said, Minister, uh, we've got a brilliant idea. The future is going to involve lots more sea travel. Uh, millions of people are going to be traveling by sea, and we need to invest in new kinds of cruise ships. The minister would, of course, say, don't be an idiot. How dare you come to me in the, in the age of the computer and, 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 and suggest that Italy should be building ships? Hmm? End of story. And yet, it's a great a success. Indeed, um, in the case of uh, wind turbines, which are now so, so important, uh, imagine if, a, if, a, if, a, if, if a, a Klaus Schwab had been a minister of uh, industry in Denmark in the 1970s and said, no, 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 we, all, we are going to go nuclear, we are going to do, do something else. So there's that. Third, we need to understand 
what is significant about technologies. The extent of use is only one measure. Uh, the really important measure is uh, the, the uh, comparison with an alternative. And more than that, we need to uh, uh, have a sense of comparison of all the technologies that might be important in world history. Many of you being engineers here will be familiar with tungsten carbide tools, vitally important in 20th century uh, engineering. I defy you to find a book in the history of technology that mentions tungsten carbide tools. I defy you to find one that does not mention atomic power. Which is more important of those, of those two? Yeah. So we have no idea what is really important. We just assert importance. And it needs to be a global history. Uh, because the dynamics of, of development are different in different uh, places. In the, in the recent decades, we've had an extraordinary phenomenon uh, which I've called technological retrogression in the world. And a very nice example of that is shipbreaking. Mm -hmm. It used to be done in Italy, in the United Kingdom, in the United States, with machines. Now it's basically done by hand on the beaches of India and Pakistan and Bangla, Bangladesh. And there are other cases also, for example, in mining. We have uh, a very capital-intensive coal mining, radically different from that of 1900. We've had a vast expansion of artisanal mining, hand mining. Millions of people are now employed in that industry that were not 20 years, um, years ago. Uh, and looking at other parts of the, of the world than, than our own uh, can help us rethink our own world. Let us, for example, uh, look at the case of China again. If we do that, we typically see that, uh, what the Chinese is doing as imitation. They are imitating, but we are innovating. Hmm? That's the contrast. Hmm? But of course, it's nonsense. It's nonsense. The Chinese are also imitating, but the key point is, is, is this. Uh, to say, for example, that Uruguayans are imitators and the British are creative would be absurd. Hmm? Yeah. I mean, most Britons, like most Ur Uruguayans, are imitators. Yeah. And one of the most interesting things about a place like Italy or Britain is that we are much better at imitating, faster at imitating than other parts of the world. We should celebrate the fact that we imitate yeah? uh, 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 and rather than pretend to be all innovative. And, um, well, let me, I, I think that's, that's probably enough on that. Let me come to a, uh, a, a conclusion. Uh, we need, essentially, to grow up when it comes to thinking about technology and society. We need to stop thinking in clichés. We need to learn to be critical, uh, to be empirical, to think globally, and to engage in debate and dialogue. To do that, we need to silence all those who talk of industrial revolutions or in Manichaean terms. This or that. <laughs> the, the machine is getting its revenge on what I'm saying. <laughs> um, uh, it, um, now, that would be very difficult, because the bad old stories are wired into our brains. They're wired into our brains because we, we take those stories to be our knowledge. So it's rather difficult to recognize our profound ignorance of this uh, topic. Now, why do we need to change? Well, we need to see what can be changed to help us imagine the new futures we need to come to grips with climate change and much else uh, besides. And we can do that, um, uh, in fact, not necessarily using AI at all, but HI, human uh, intelligence. We need new knowledge to meet the challenges of uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the future by recognizing that uh, AI or other new technologies will not radically transform our world. The great 
the, 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 the likely thing they will do is just add to our world and continue to make us ignorant of the profound changes that we need to make to the world in order to change it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much. It was a great and um, provocative talk. Thanks a lot for having brought these topics here. Um, I, will ask, I would like to ask the audience if they have questions. If you have questions or comments in Italian, please let me know at the beginning so I have to ask the speaker to use the uh, earphones. Uh, we would like to ask a question or uh, make a comment. Otherwise, I can start myself to break the ice. So thanks a lot. So I will, I will uh, speak in English. <laughs> um, well, one question from for uh, a historian of science like me, and also who also needs to to change the way of teaching probably these courses in an engineering um, a university like this one. I would like to. Uh, to ask you if you can uh, elaborate on what might be a, a new knowledge of history in the way we should change our knowledge uh, to meet the challenges or climate changes or all the challenges which are in front of us. Uh, well, what might be the role of history and what might be the role of history teaching in, uh, for example, engineering uh, schools? Because that, that might be important for this particular situation, but also for me personally, if you uh, can elaborate with this kind of perspective. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. In fact, uh, I, I have many years of experience of teaching uh, engineering students uh, history. And um, I've, I've certainly found that while uh, professors of, of engineering and schools of engineering you know, want students to be taught about innovation and how the world has changed through industrial revolutions and all the rest of it, uh, that the students don't certainly find that quite attra very attractive. I mean, they can reproduce the stories, that's, that's fine. But of course, it doesn't connect with their real experience. Mm -hmm. And I found that if one does talk in, in the way that I have about real technological worlds that they, that they have known or they, 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 they live in, they immediately understand. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, 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 they are interested in uh, the material world that they are, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are living in. And they, they also very, very quickly recognize the kind of rhetoric that they are being, 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 uh, uh, being offered. I find it very refreshing then to, to, to just think for themselves about, about uh, what, they're, what they are doing. Another example, would, 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 related example, would, would, would be this. Uh, engineers are now told that they are going to be creators or innovators or something like that. Work, by implication, working in research and development, I, I suppose. Uh, but of course, most engineers historically have not been inventors or, uh, or creators of the novel. They've been maintainers of the existing or the or developers uh, 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 in a sort of incremental way of, of, of what's, what's, ex what's existing. And um, I think engineering students often find that um, actually an appealing uh, prospect. They don't necessarily want to be uh, uh, inventors um, uh, or, 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 anything, or anything like that. So uh, I, I think there's a, there's a great desire f to, to, be, to be given realistic expectations about, uh, about, w about their careers and what, and what they could, they could possibly, possibly do as well. So my experience is to say that, that, that students have responded very, very positively to the sort of arguments that I've been put, put, putting forward today, more positively indeed than to the traditional arguments. Um, at the level of um, um, the conceptual level, what, 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 what do you think should be the role, the role of history in, in, in how we change our knowledge to meet the challenges? I mean, more in general as historians, but also our, our yes. we would like to, to build these new narratives. How, how do we, yes. can we build these new narratives? Apart from, the, the, well, of course, you, you already mentioned a few uh, 
uh, lines of research. Basically, you open some research agendas, right? Um, but more in general, on the more conceptual level, what is the role of history in shaping yeah. the way we think about the future? Well, uh, I mean, w uh, w one very important way is, I, I, I put it this, this way, that, that uh, although it may not seem we are uh, uh, the great experts on the future, we historians are, in fact, the great experts on the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's not because the, the past is a guide to the future, uh, except in one very important respect. We as historians have to train ourselves to, to understand that our historical characters do not know how the Second World War will, will end, you know, or do not know that uh, uh, Columbus is going to sail to what becomes uh, America. So, it, it, in other words, we have to train ourselves to re to remember always that we don't know what the future will will bring, mm -hmm. and indeed the future is by its very nature uncertain. Uh, and and that's, therefore, as historians, we are the experts on the future because the first thing we know about the future is that it is it is uh, it is uncertain. Um, so that'd be one one important lesson. Another one would be, for example, to show. Uh, students, the claims that have been made for new technologies in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were to say, you know, for example, that aeroplanes were uh, thought to, to be agents of world peace uh, from before the First World War, certainly into, into the, the Second World War, that those arguments are transported onto atomic weapons in 1945. It's essentially the same argument. If you teach somebody that, uh, it, it's easy to do, they will be much less inclined to believe the sort of rhetoric that we've been uh, talking about. The internet will do this or that. Well, actually, uh, we heard this about electricity or we heard this about, uh, about, uh, uh, about, about radio. So I think, um, I think actually history can be an extraordinarily powerful tool uh, for opening the eyes of, of, uh, of engineers and indeed, indeed others to, to the kind of realities of the world and indeed the realities of the of the uh, of the future, but not the not the standard kind of history that's that's uh, that's taught, uh, evidently. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So, uh, is somebody helping me with the? Okay, thanks. So, do you will you talk in Italian or in English? English. Ah, okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. Enlightening. I have a question about um, this. Uh, expansion of technology. So, of course, indeed, there are more bicycles today than there were 100 years ago, even though the car was supposed to extinguish the bicycle. But in S so we have this expansionist sort of world that we're all familiar with, especially in the context of global climate change. But in teaching the history of technology um, to talk about the future, you know, that is uh, a very sort of um, capitalist way of looking at things. Is there, alter are there alternatives that you find um, useful as a way to talk about how people um, uh, use these things to kind of manipulate narratives of, of, of uh, social narratives? So, uh, for example, within academic circles, speculative, Futures or speculative pasts have become more popular. Um, we have this example of the fact that things keep expanding, but what about um, the fact that certain technologies uh, do get replaced, like um, say the telegraph or something? Are, are these sort of instruments uh, to teach people more about a, a, a deeper critical nature of technology? Uh, yes, I, 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 I think there, 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 there's an important task there. Um, I um, would first want to insist, actually, they're just telling some straight empirical stories uh, uh, in, the, in themselves uh, uh, provide uh, critique. But to, 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 to take up your point, yes, I think we, it, it is important, but maybe only for really advanced students, to, to understand the ways in which technology is, in, is invoked uh, uh, to, 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 to prevent uh, choice being 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 made. Uh, there's 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 one best way of doing things, and we better do it uh, do it that way. 
Uh, how, to, how to counter that? Well, I think you, you look at different places in the world. Uh, you look at the politics of the 20th century and how different sorts of political regimes have dealt with the question of, 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 of technology. Uh, one, one looks at all sorts of critical traditions around, around technology. Though there I have to say that one of the, the problems with the critical traditions of technology is that they often invert the kinds of stories that promoters uh, tell. So uh, it's not that aeroplanes are going to be good, it's that aeroplanes are going to be, are going to be bad. Yeah? Uh, it's, it's not that, uh, that the technology is going to lead to, to, to new human freedoms, in fact, technology is going to, going to imprison us. So we have, a, we have the, the same story but evaluated in very different ways. And I think the main thing I want to do is to say actually the main stories that we have are, are just not good stories. Yeah, so we need to start somewhere else when we, when we evaluate, perhaps when we, when we moralize. In fact, I think we are uh, too ready to moralize around, around uh, technology. And that's partly from a, a, a belief of the sort of, of discussed, which is that, that technology is only now becoming important in some, in some real way. So only now do we face these moral challenges. I say, well, actually, we've, we've lived with all these things for, for a very long, uh, long time. Not, not always well, of course, uh, but, but we have, and we can, we can learn from, from, from that. Thanks a lot. Are there other... Um, uh, sorry, in Italian or...? Yeah. Italian, can you...? Yep. <laughs> Il modello che lei ha smontato un pezzettino alla volta, l'ha detto all'inizio, il modello di Schwab e il modello di Davos. Che possibilità ha una via intellettuale come quella da lei proposta di smontare davvero una narrazione che chiaramente ha dietro un interesse e un potere diverso? Uh, well, if, if my uh, uh, observations are, are correct, very, very little. Yeah. Uh, be because <laughs> uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm describing is, is the extraordinary power of, of, these, of, these, uh, of the, these, 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 these concepts. On the other hand, uh, I, I think there are some simple tricks, like not using the word technology. Mm -hmm. And if we start talking about cars or washing machines or, or wood or steel or computers, we can, we can and do have uh, a more intelligent uh, discussion about the things in, in, in the world and, and how, they, how they affect us. So if, if I were world dictator, the first thing I would do is to ban the word technology, and probably science as well. And with that, I'd raise the IQ of the human population by at least 10 percentage points. Thanks a lot. Um, there is time for one last question. Uh, sorry, there, there was this sent before. Uh, let's see if we can have uh, five minutes <laughs> more. But we have, we start with the, with the I don't know the name. Are, are you speaking in English, right? Well, the second one it will be in Italian. Okay, so maybe we can have these two, and then I'm sorry, why we have to give time to change the room. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask. Um, so of course, uh, a lot of these uh, fears about technology um, have been repeating. Um, at the same time, like today, we have uh, some real danger like climate change, evidence-based danger. So we have the problem of these uh, uh, narratives uh, of fear that are repeating, but then there is a, a different si situation. How can we uh, so communicate uh, uh, in better ways to, uh, to, you know, to address attention and, uh, yeah, on climate change? That's a, that's a very in, in, interesting point because we've we've got used to these uh, fear-mongering stories about uh, AI today and lots of airplanes, atomic power, lots of lots of things in in the past. So when we think about technology, we, we just we know we're going to hear those sorts of stories, and and we are uh, uh, unlikely to take them to take them seriously. So yes, I I, I think. Um, I think there is a, there is a, a very important problem uh, about, about fear-mongering uh, there. Um, I think the answer is politics. This is the, one of the great political issues of, 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 of our time, and you have to mobilize people. 
uh, in, a, in a deep way. It's not a question of propaganda. It's, it's, it's not a question of fear-mongering. It's a, it's a question of uh, getting people to understand that we can change our world and that, and that, we, that we need to do that uh, 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 as well. And, but I, I recognize that it, it is a real challenge because our, our culture has increasingly become uh, less amenable to, to rational political discourse, which I th think is absolutely fundamental to this, to this problem. Yeah. Uh, there is time for one last question uh, that I think would be in Italian. Oh, Italian, yeah. <laughs> La mia è più una domanda riguardo diciamo, alla narrazione offerta da Schwab, o meglio quello che dice Schwab e il modo in cui lei l'ha contestata. Eh, anzitutto mi sembra che Schwab, eh, non so, analizzi il... Um, pre premetto che è una prospettiva più filosofica perché... Um, appunto studio quello quindi eh, penso che in Schwab sia assente diciamo proprio un ci sia un problema terminologico cioè intendere i non so tecnologia con il concetto più morbido di tecnica o tecne come la identificavano i greci oppure la tecnica in Heidegger con Gestell cioè intendere come tecnica la provocazione dell'uomo nei rispetti della, della natura perché se la si intende così allora ci sono milioni di avanzamenti tecnologici, quindi non so. E poi dal punto di vista storico credo che Schwab elida completamente, cioè elimini completamente da questa narrazione una prospettiva strutturalista o post-strutturalista, cioè intendere le, diciamo, il progresso come qualcosa di, di oggettivo, di oggettivante, elude completamente il problema del soggetto, quindi il fatto che ci sia un soggetto che faccia determinati eh, atti in determinati in determinate mh, epoche storiche. Eh, non so se questa è la narrazione corrente o dominante e così via, però è una narrazione che credo sia molto ehm, pericolosa o comunque non sia il massimo in una prospettiva di progresso, proprio perché se noi intendiamo appunto la, il progresso in maniera oggettiva e eludiamo il problema del soggetto, tanto che ad esempio anche nell'individuazione nell di un fenomeno dal punto di vista fenomenologico è, è sempre necessario un soggetto trascendentale che osservi il fenomeno e quindi intendere una, un progresso non fatto da uomini eliminando il rapporto che c'è tra uomo e tecnica credo possa essere qualcosa di molto pericoloso e infruttuoso, non so. Uh, yes, uh, we, we, we agree and uh, it, it, is, it is indeed, indeed very, very, very dangerous. Um, and I think it's a very important reminder that while we in, in the university you know, might uh, have a, 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 a particular sense of the development of different intellectual approaches to the human condition and to nature and all these things, uh, um, the, the story for the elites out there may be a very, very different one. Yeah? Uh, and I, I think we also need to to, to, to recognize the, the, the possibility of you know, systematic kind of degradation in the, in the quality of um, uh, 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 political uh, uh, reflection on, on, on the realities of, 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 of our times. So I think we need to, we need to, we need to find ways to analyze this kind of talk. Uh, and I, I don't think, I don't think we, we can do that through the usual ways in which we understand intellectual history. But I, I agree with the, the sentiments you've expressed uh, wholeheartedly. Thank you very much. This uh, helped me thank the speaker again. Thanks for coming here.